Okay, I'm going to be doing a video here, an interview with uh, Brother Eric John Phelps, and um, really want to do this to get the body of Christ to know about the fact of the presence of the Jesuits. I've talked about them for many years, and uh, Brother Eric here is, I would say, probably the expert on the Jesuit order. And I guess we'll start out here real quick with a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that our time here uh, would be um, well used of you, Lord, that we would be able to bring you glory through this and, and be able to warn the body of Christ about a very serious threat that it's, it's uh, getting more and more powerful and a lot of people are very ignorant about it. And I just pray, Lord, that you would be here in our midst and I ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, real quick, if you want to just, uh, just tell us your testimony, how you came to know the Lord and how you came to hear about the Jesuit order. Yeah, I was... Um, I was raised uh, an atheist and oh, pro-communist. My grandparents, my paternal grandparents were communists. And uh, my maternal grandparents were apostate Protestants. And my parents were apostate Protestants. So I never heard the gospel. I never was ever taken to church except maybe for Easter when I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. And um, when I was 17, I was uh, confronted with the gospel when my friend's brothers were saved. And his brother was different, and he was this killer guy on the uh, football team. His name was Steve Hirschman. And I knew his brother Greg, and so I went over to see Greg, and story Steve, and I saw that he was very different, and we had the Bible, and I was shocked. So one thing led to another, and I was given the gospel, and I got hurt, hurt my leg, I mean my knee, and while I was in my bed reading the Gospel of John, I was saved, reading you know, Christ died for my sins, and was buried and rose again, and believed that they're reading the Gospel of John in my bed. So I was about 17 that time, it was like 1971, and um, then later that year I, I graduated and went to the Air Force, spent almost five years in the Air Force, and, and uh, worked in churches off base. It was in a church off base in Spangdown, Germany. It was an Air Force base the Air Force people went because they couldn't meet on the chapel because it was so apostate. Hmm. And um, so that's what I did there and came back, went to Bible College, Lancaster Bible College for Baptist Bible College in Clark Summit, it was a GARBC school, and then uh, two years of Lancaster Bible down here in Lancaster, mm -hmm. which was apostate, <clears throat> having departed from the Reformation Bible, both of them had. Right. And uh, But then when I was... <clears throat> Way back when I was 10 years old, I was fourth grade when Kennedy was shot. And I, that deeply affected me, and I thought, I need to find who did that. Because I knew LBJ was a liar, and he was taking this swearing in, and he was obviously, obviously involved. I just, and I perceived that at 10 years old. But then um, that stayed with me for a while, then I was saved, went to Bible college. In Bible college, I found out that the Jesuits had killed Lincoln. Hmm. And I had a teacher there, his name was Rembert Carter. He got his doctorate in history when he was like 24, 25 from uh, Edinburgh in Scotland. So he was, he was elite and considered himself so. But he did have a class on the assassination of Lincoln carried out by the Jesuits. And he had an original copy of Burke McCarty's work, uh, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. It was written in 1924. And this dear lady was, was, was saved. She'd been a Roman Catholic. She was saved and then she spent seven or ten years researching the whole assassination of Lincoln and proved the Jesuits did it. And I have the book. You can get the book from Ozark Publishers, too. But, um, so, it was the assassination of uh, Lincoln, and then when I was in Bible college, the whole issue of reversion issue came up. And, uh, you know, I had read the, after I was saved, I read the NIV for a while, or the New American Standard, and there was something wrong with it. Yeah. So, so somebody said, because and I didn't know anything about it. I just knew something was wrong. With it. And somebody said he need to read the King James. Well, I read that, and I knew I was reading, reading the Bible. And uh, so, I was brought the King James with me when I went to Bible college, and they handed me Bruce Metzger's third edition of the Critical Text. You know, <laughs> uh, what they do that for? Yeah. And 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 I had all the footnotes and all all that's where you can decide what's the scripture and what's not the scripture. And I said, if that's the case. I belong unsaved doing what I did before, you know. There's no, if there's no final authority, there is no salvation. Amen. So I, yeah. I left Baptist Bible College and went to Lancaster Bible College. And of course, Baptist Bible was getting into, um, 
extreme Calvinism that Christ didn't die for the world only for the elect and, and uh, things like that and so I decided I was going to leave there and went to Lancaster well that was <laughs> jumping from out of the pot into the fire mm -hmm. and they still had the same apostate Greek text and I graduated from there in 1981 and, uh, and I was in business for a while doing concrete work I did concrete work for 15 years and uh, I did health work for another 10 years in alternative health matters. And then now I'm doing what I do now is uh, my websites, Priest of the Gospel, Exposed to Jesuits, wrote the book, finished my first um, uh, treatise in 1999, Vatican Assassins. And then I put out another one in, 19, in 2000, and my first book was 2001, the first edition. And my second edition is kind of a quickie little thing. And the third edition that I have is came out in 2007. And so I have uh, five editions of the third edition, five printings of the third edition, which is 1,836 pages, 760 pictures and portraits. So it's about the history of the Jesuit order mm -hmm. and um, up to the present day, the Kennedy assassination and then 9 11, with their involvement in that. So meanwhile, I have my the church here, I have a 24 7 world radio, and then I have Vatican Assassins website, and, and I teach my private citizenship class, which is uh, teaching other people how to be restored to their former status of a private citizen of the United States under Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. They are no longer deemed to be surety for an artificial person, the old cap's name, which is a Roman Catholic entity. I teach you how to go back to that, be a private citizen, and use the all caps as an entity to interface in business with. And so I teach my course once a week, once a month, pardon me, and have one coming up this March. Oh, great. Praise the Lord. Well, yeah. uh, you know, what I want to talk about here, I think, in this interview, I think it's important to understand for people. I mean, you, you said about your book, and, and uh, I have a copy of it myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not, not sure which edition this one is, but uh, I've had it for quite a few years. It might be the, uh, yeah. what you say? That's the, most, that's the most recent one. This one is? Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, you know, so if anybody out there wants to hear about the history of all the, the Jesuits and everything else, I recommend this. I've recommended it for a long time. But I think the thing that's most important... For people to understand um, is the fact that the Jesuits are a military order and because of that they use a lot of military type tactics and it's you know if I get this from atheists they say I'll come down on the Jesuits and the Catholics and they say well it's just one religion versus another and it's not nope. the the Jesuits um, they're they're more political than they are you know that religion to them is is kind of a means to an end so to speak that's right. You know, and and it's, I think, I mean, I, I'll ask you this question, brother. I mean, do you believe that there are any mainstream Protestant denominations that have not been thoroughly infiltrated by the Jesuits? Nope. Not at all. Yeah. Absolutely. Everyone. Yeah, I agree with that. And well, I, well, World Council churches. World Council, National Council, it used to be Federal Council when the Rockefellers created. I mean, Rockefellers are Jesuit cogers, the papal knights. And so they, they managed to... Uh, and, uh, take in all the Protestant denominations that were once their enemies that brought about successful revolutions against the temple power of the Pope. So the Jesuits did this through their Scottish Rite Freemason. All your top Protestant leaders are some sort of Scottish Rite Freemason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you'll find this if you do the research. And so a lot of atheists think that they're safe being outside of what they call organized religion. And it's like, well, I really hate to tell you, but you're still under that Jesuitical system. And, uh, yeah, yeah, well, modern-day atheism is a result of rationalism. Rationalism is a creature of the Jesuits, according to Luigi de Santis in his work, Pope Repousiism and Jesuitism, that he wrote in the 1850s. So the atheists really have a Jesuitical religion. Um, the Jesuits love atheism. They love, that's why they impose communism. Communism is based upon an atheistic religion. Mm -hmm. The Jesuits uh, put Francis, used Francis Cardinal Spellman to put Mao Zedong in power in 1949 with the State Department that he controlled. They used, um, they used uh, their various agents to put Joseph Stalin in power with the Bolshevik Revolution, ultimately the purges in the 30s. They used FDR to formally recognize the USSR in 1933, one of the things he did in the, the first year he was put in office. So FDR was overseen by Jesuit Edmund Walsh. So everything that FDR did had his blessing and had the oversight of Jesuit Walsh, which includes the, the uh, financing and bringing major corporations into USSR in the 30s, including Ford. 
So the Jesuits are the masters of atheism. Their communist governments are atheistic. The Jesuits are all the communist governments, including this communist government here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree with that. I'm going to read a quote here from a book just to kind of further uh, show all this. Let me see if I can get that. Did you ever see this book before? Oh, oh, no, I haven't. I actually got this down at the Clay Bookstore. Ah. You know where that is, I'm yep. sure. Oh, yeah. uh, this is uh, page 74. They, says, they say, We are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under its control there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both of these, that is the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. The first is wielded by the church. The second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hand of the priest. The second by the hand of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and per by permission of the priests. You know, yeah. I mean, I'll, let me see if I can and get that. That, that is a, just a very close uh, quotation of Unum Sanctum, which was 1302. It's a papal bull in 1302. And that's where they defend the temple and spiritual power of the Pope, almost word for word there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing I have here, I actually have a copy of the uh, Dewey Reams, the uh, New Testament, put out by the Catholic Church. And I actually, I just did a video, I'll talk about this in a minute, um, on there's a, there's a Louisiana police captain right now that uh, is getting some popularity because he's going, uh, putting out videos saying he's going to go after gangs and hunt them down because they're heathen and all this. And he's a, he's a papist, just incredible. Mm -hmm. Did a video on him yesterday. Probably a night of Columbus. Yeah, it might be. I'm not sure. But um, down here, page 557, they said, I, I had referenced this, but I didn't show this. I didn't have it with me at the time, but I'll just read this to further you know, illustrate the point. It says, uh, the Protestants foolishly, it, this is the footnotes on Revelation 17. I should say that. Okay. The Protestants foolishly expounded of Rome, the shedding of blood of martyrs, uh, for their... For that there they put heretics to death and allow of their punishment in other countries. But their blood is not called the blood of saints, no more than the blood of thieves, man killers, and other malefactors. <laughs> for the shedding of which, by order of justice, no commonwealth shall answer. So I've showed that in other videos, but uh, you know, I'll show this here. Yeah, that's important because, see, they are validating their doctrine of killing heretics. And remember, mm -hmm. according to the Jesuits, there is no salvation without the shedding of the blood of the heretic. Okay. Yeah. And by any means necessary. Any yeah. means. Yeah. So that means we're going to use a medical inquisition like they've had for the last 80 years here. They kill 100 million people with their medical profession, their allopathic medical profession. It's all an inquisition. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I've seen that within my own family. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. But... Um, <clears throat> I think the the you know they have control of the Protestants, pretty much across the board. You know, mm -hmm. I would say that you know unless there's some kind of an independent one someplace, uh, they might not there. But most of them have have been controlled. And of course, um, you know, using military tactics, of course, one would be disarmament. And spiritually speaking, they're taking away the King James Bible, which we discussed That's earlier. Right. That's right. Replace or the, it with or the Luther Bible or any other Bible. It is a Reformation Bible in the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually have uh, another thing here, which I've... This is always fun to show to uh, Jehovah's Witnesses when they come. Um, I ask them if they have... If they know what a Jesuit is. And, of course, 90% of the time they say, Oh, what's a Jesuit? I actually have this here. This is a Nestle's 25th edition, edition put out by the uh, Watchtower Bible yep. and Tract Society. Yep. And right here, let's see if I can get this on camera. Yeah, yeah, they got the Jesuits right there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Eberhard Nestle, yeah. And what was it? Eberhard Nestle, including these Spanish Jesuit scholar Jose Maria Bovier and Jesuit A. Merck. Yep. UBS Tech, 1975. Oh, uh, yep. the United Bible Societies are totally taken over by the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I show people, too, that, you know, the, I mean, we can keep going off about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but Vatican too. I have that. It talks yeah. about uh, making translations with separated churches and things. Yeah. Um, the it talks Nestle's about a new world order in there too, new international authority. Yeah. Yep. And yeah. The, the one who was the editor of it was Avery Dulles. Avery Dulles was a Jesuit. He was a son of John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary oh, really? of State. Yes, he was oh. a nephew of uh, Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, and also yeah. Avery Dulles was an Adamalta. Hmm. Wow. 
I know I recognize the name Dulles, but I didn't, I never heard his name before. Interesting. Whenever you, whenever you go through Dulles Airport, just think of the Jesuits with Avery, John Foster, and Alan Dulles. Hmm. And you have also the Nestle's text, the modern editions of it, where one of the editors was Carlo Maria Martini. Martini, another Jesuit. Another Jesuit, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, it's incredible. And But what I'm seeing more and more as time goes by, they just seem to be coming out and they're getting more and more bold where they really don't even cover up things anymore. They just, you know, it's it's. I really feel that they're trying to openly take over this country. I mean, they, they've pretty much taken over it, but openly right. coming out and just saying, here we are, right. this is what we're going to do. Remember, they've taken this country since March 9th, 1933. Mm -hmm. That's when they, that's when March 6th, FDR put forward his proclamation 2039, declaring a state of national emergency, premised on the emerge, uh, premised on the trading with the enemy act. So he used the trading with the enemy act. It was never intended to be used domestically. It was only for World War One. So he used that as a springboard for his proclamation 20, 2039. And then three days later on the 9th, Congress approves and confirms that declaration of of an emergency and a war, and they approve and confirm it with their Emergency Banking Relief Act. And then proclamation uh, FDR comes out later that day with his Proclamation 2040 that continues Proclamation 2039. So we've been under Trading with the Enemy Act and the Emergency, and the emergency Banking Relief Act is an amended Trading with the Enemy Act, and also the, the Proclamation of FDR 2040. So we've been under military government since that day, and we've been under military jurisdiction since April 25th, 1938. That's why every flag you see in every courtroom has gold fringe, every mm -hmm. flag in every school is gold fringe, every hotel flag, you name it, it's all gold fringe, which is a military color pursuant to Army Regulation 840-10. So we've been under their military government all this time. They've got us involved in all these foreign wars to fight and destroy these nations, to make them subject to the Pope. And now it's our turn to be a victim of that design. So I, I'm completely convinced you're gonna use Donald Trump to put Hellcat Hillary in power. And yeah. so that she can appoint these new justices and whatever, and maybe even declare their martial law that they want to do. But uh, I have no doubt that they're orchestrating both sides because they control the Republican Democratic Party uh, for their own benefit. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I found it interesting, though, that uh, Donald Trump's also Jesuit trained. Jesuit you know. trained at Fordham, and he's also 33rd degree Freemason. Yeah. And there, there's no way you're going to recover from three or four bankruptcies without being in with the big boys, restoring your credit in New York. And all those guys are the Knights. The Knights of Malta are in the big banks. Wow. Now, I have a question on that as far as, uh, I know you have different terms. Uh, Jesuit, Jesuit temporal coadjutor. Um, mm, co coadjutor. Co okay. Mm -hmm. um, would you consider somebody that goes through a Jesuit education, would they be considered a Jesuit, or do you consider them just Jesuit trained? They're just Jesuit trained and generally working with the order, although they're not a Jesuit, they're not, they're maybe professed of the third vow, but they're definitely not of the fourth. So they've never taken any priestly vows, but they're working for the Jesuits as their agents. Men like Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, every bonesman is a Jesuit coadjutor. Every okay. political man that went through Georgetown University is a Jesuit coadjutor. Um, every, same way with Fordham in New York, same way with Boston College, Loyola mm -hmm. in Chicago, Loyola in New Orleans. All their graduates that they put in places of government, banking and so on, are all working for the Jesuits. Right. What about the, like the spook world, uh, military okay. intelligence and things? Oh, yes. Uh, the Jesuits control the Pentagon. The Pentagon was uh, <clears throat> created in 1941, built about that time, and the contractor that built it was a Knight of Malta from Philadelphia named John McShane. Hmm. So John McShane was the contractor that built it, and it's always a Knight of Malta that's ahead of it or the right hand of it. Uh, some of your early Knights of Malta that ran the Pentagon were uh, Alan Dulles. Uh, and you have uh, William J. Casey, Knight of Malta, trained by Jesuits of Fordham. Yeah, you have uh, George J. Tennant, pardon me, Knight of Malta, trained by Jesuits of Georgetown. You have uh, Leon Panetta, Knight of Malta, trained by Jesuits of Santa Clara University. So the entire spook world, J. Edgar Hoover, 33rd degree Freemason, but his the guy who really ran the FBI at the time was Carthur Deloach, uh, at the time of the Kennedy assassination. Carthur Deloach was a knight of Malta, and he retired, went to work for Pepsi, PepsiCo. So all the big knights are running all the intelligence communities together. Department of Homeland Security, 
I call it Department of Homeland Security. Sure. And FBI, CIA, DIA, all of it, they're all run by the Jesuits overseeing it uh, from Georgetown. Yeah, yeah, I've, I believe that. Uh, how do the Knights of Columbus fit into this whole thing? Knights of Columbus are subordinate to the Jesuits. They're kind of like a hatchet men for the Jesuit order. The Knights of Columbus were created in, 17, in 1882, uh, and their place of their creation was New Haven, Connecticut. So they could be right near their brother Bones at Yale. Hmm. So uh, they are the ones that are in banking, politics, military. They're men of power, men of wealth. And Admiral Benson, during World War One, the head of the Navy, the one responsible for getting all the ships overseas in World War One, was a Knight of Columbus. Uh, he later became a Knight of St. Gregory. Uh, we have a Knight of Columbus that was the head of the Supreme Court in the 1900s. His name is Edward White, uh, involved in some very serious decisions. We have a Knight of Columbus that was the overseer of Woodrow Wilson. His name was Joseph P. Tumulty for two-year terms of Woodrow Wilson. So they put an apostate Protestant Presbyterian in there, but they have the Knights of Columbus running him, and he's being run by James Cardinal Gibbons out of Baltimore. So the Knights of Columbus are busy manning the empire with its uh, entertainment, economics, academia, uh, politics, religion. Uh, only Catholics can be Knights of Columbus, but uh, Catholics and Protestants can be, bo be both high-level Freemasons. And the unification of all this is in the Bush family. You have Jeb Bush. <laughs> Jeb Bush is a fourth degree Knight of Columbus, involved hmm. in running the drug trade out of Florida. That's right. Working with the mafia. Yeah. Um, you've got D that. George W., who's Skull and Bones, his brother. Mm -hmm. You've got his father, George Herbert Walker Bush, who's Skull and Bones. Bones you've yeah. got his uncle, Prescott Bush Jr., he's the Knight of Malton. All these various knighthoods and brotherhoods dovetail completely with the Bush family. And the Bush family was intimately involved with the assassination of Scalia just recently through the Poindexter people, because John Poindexter is very much connected with the Bush people. So, hmm. yeah. so somebody that would make it to the fourth de degree level in the Knights of Columbus, would they be, uh, I don't even, I mean, how do you make it up to that high? In that? Well, you have to be in for a while. But then you have to be asked to join the fourth. And the fourth degree is essentially the, the bloody vow of the Jesuit order, their fourth degree. So hmm. they'll kill heretics, liberals, and overthrow governments for this purpose of restoring the temple power of the Pope again. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, what I you wish. said is very important. You see, the Jesuit order is a military order. The Knights of Columbus, a military order. The White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, military orders of 1915, the second Klan, not the first Klan. Um, the Skull and Bones, but it's a military order. So there's all military, there's the, they're the new Knights Templars that were suppressed by the Pope in the 1312. So the Jesuits had the revived Knights Templars. And basically the idea there for the Vatican would be then to have kind of a building an army, almost like a militia for the Vatican, so to speak, That's Minutemen correct. for the Vatican that could rise up at some point in time. That's correct. And you see, they're the leaders. All the guys underneath them are, you know, thou tens of thousands. But these guys are the leaders of men of real power. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I was uh, trying to think of another thing I was going to ask here. What's my wife heard a question down here? Uh, what are the Jesuit degrees? You said about the third, fourth, or the vowels or something? What's there are that? four vowels. Four vowels. Many Jesuits take the first three vowels, and uh, they're called professed, professed of the third vowel, professed of the fourth vowel. Hmm. And uh, most Jesuits are professed of the third vowel. I mean, they are, they are a cadaver for the Pope, no matter what. They're a cadaver for their superior, really, because you see, the Jesuit order is outside of the Roman Catholic Church. Mm. No Jesuit is subject to a priest, a cardinal, bishop, archbishop, anybody within the Catholic Church. They're only subject mm. to their immediate superior. So there are four degrees, four vows, and the Jesuit is subject to his superior. The superior is subject to the provincial. The provincial is subject to the assistant. And the assistant, and there are ten of them, assistants are subject to the Jesuit general or the black pope himself. So it's strictly a military order with rank and file, chain of command. Hmm. So the so the fourth vowel would be then, you know, you, you wouldn't just get to that very easily. That'd be more of a... No. M.F. Cusack says in her book, The Black Pope, that it takes 31 years to be professed of the fourth vowel. Hmm. But I know of other Jesuits who would profess of the fourth vowel without being in for 31 years. 
Because remember, it takes 15 years of education after high school to become a Jesuit. Hmm, so really. you don't get in the Jesuit order until you're like in your 30s. But you're completely versed in all subjects. So that if you were dropped in any country, you could immediately take it over with it. economics, politics, military, whatever. You're versed in how to do that. Huh. That's very interesting. Now, another question I have, because this kind of relates a little bit more to what's going on right now, and I believe that because the Protestant denominations have been taken over, I think that Bible-believing Christians are really the new target for infiltration. and Especially the King James men. Yes. They're the ones they want to attack. Yeah. And it's trying to use Jesuits like Martin Richland and others like him. You think he's a Jesuit? I know he is. Yeah? I have no doubt that he was. He prepared I, for it. He yeah. said he wanted to be a Jesuit. That's right. He and did. everything he does stinks of Jesuit casuistry. Everything. I've, I he wondered endeared, that. He endeared himself to me, pretended he really liked me, endeared himself to me. I advocated his work only to find out he was an arch heretic and did everything he could to discredit me. Hmm. Yep. So he's a military man. Yeah, it, I, I got that kind of feeling from him. I mean, that, that spirit mm -hmm. there, it's just not right. Uh -uh. Uh, it's not just a, a brother that I would have some disagreements with. There's no. a different spirit there. No, um, very interesting. Uh, but on that note, uh, there was a, a guy I, I mentioned earlier, uh, Captain Clay Higgins down in Louisiana. And he's a policeman, and he's coming out with these videos, openly threatening gang members. You know, if you we're going to hunt you down, you're heretics, you're heathen. We're going to give you chances for redemption when you come to my jail. I mean, it's just, it just sounds like an inquisition here. I mean, it's yeah. it's incredible. Well, it says New Orleans, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it says what's New Orleans. They run New Orleans for well, at least two hundred years. Remember the Clay Shaw, the whole thing of trademark New Orleans was. Well, absolute Jesuit run when he was involved in Kennedy assassination. Uh, hmm. You have uh, Jim Garrison, he's a New Orleans district attorney there, and uh, he's absolutely thwarted in the prosecution of Clay Shaw, who was a knight of Malta, who was an intimate friend of uh, the dame of Malta, Lindy Boggs. She lives in New Orleans too, who was Hale Boggs' wife. Hale Boggs was murdered because he said he, uh, Oswald never shot anybody. He was on the Warren Commission, Hale Boggs. Hmm. So, now, uh, Loyola, uh, Los, uh, Louisiana. New, Orleans, New Orleans is completely in the hands of the Jesuits through Loyola University in New Orleans. Yeah, but I found it interesting. He did a video a little while ago here um, promoting it as some kind of a website. He's selling gear and things like this, military type of gear. And he does this, it's propaganda, you know, and he comes walking out and he sits down on his front porch and he's got the Bible laying there on his porch swing and big <laughs> statue of Mary beside him. And, it's huh. a, and it was a King James Bible. And I thought, now I've talked to Catholics, they're not allowed to read the King James Bible. You know, I mean, you when they get to be it's older, It's still on the list of forbidden books. Yeah. Of the Holy Office of Inquisitions. Ex, but, exper, ex, expurgages. Purging of the books. Just like the you know, ninth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. That's on the forbidden books. Yeah. Because it has 11 pages on the Jesuits. No, boy. Yeah. Can't have that. <laughs> but, you know, I, I thought, found that interesting because I thought, you know, here you have a Roman Catholic posing like he's a, he has a King James Bible and he reads it. You know, and I thought that kind of further adds to my suspicion that they're really trying right now very hard to get into the King James only Bible believing movement and kind of come in and, and uh, sow some division. And uh, yeah, they come in with a King James Bible, but you have to listen very carefully to their doctrines. They know how to talk, they know the lingo, but what's this? What's this heresy like, like uh, um, establishment commandment? That was mm -hmm. Richling's big heresy. That's yeah. work salvation. That's entirely work salvation. So you have to delve, delve in very carefully what is their doctrine. Mm -hmm. Then you can find it. Then you can attack them yeah. and defeat them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's another question I have because I know that the Jesuits, in some of their vows and things, they say that they can even speak against their own church. Of course. But is there a level to which, is are there certain things that they will not speak against because it relates to the military power there? No. No. They, they If they're told to do it, they'll do it. Hmm. Um, you had uh, Teilhard de Chardin, who was a French Jesuit. He went against certain of the things the Pope said. But he was told to because Teilhard de Chardin is the father of the New Age movement. 
the Jesuit of the New Age movement. So, hmm. the Vatican openly is against it. They'll be openly against the Pope, but secretly they're behind it. Remember, the Vatican always has this policy. It has an open but false policy. Then it has a secret but true policy. You always have to look at everything they say like that. What is the Pope saying? Well, Pope John Paul II said, well, we're against the war in Iraq. Secretly, his Knights of Malta here caused it with 9-11. So they have an open but false, but openly we're against abortion. Secretly, they never are against it. They never stop any abortion legislation. So we always mm -hmm. it's a two-headed Janus. We always look at it for what it's saying and then what it really means privately and what its doctrine is. Yeah. Well, I've found, you know, where I start questioning somebody is when I start to see uh, some of the shades of Roman Catholic, you know, teaching coming through where you have replacement theology because that's a big thing that relates to the military structure of the Vatican, the Jesuit order, because, yep. of course, they want to rule the world from Jerusalem, yep. which is Bible prophecy yep. coming to true. Coming true. Yep. They'll also change the um, identification of Mystery Babylon back in Revelation yep. 17. That's I've right. seen that as well. Tex Mars does that. Yeah, Stephen Anderson. Yeah, you know. both, both Jesuit co-educators, no doubt. Yeah, I believe Challenge that. Challenge Mars to a debate, not taken. Yeah. Yeah, they'll go on Alex Jones. the same thing and, with Anderson, too. Yeah. And um, another one which which has become more and more clear to me over the years has been this post-trib belief system where they're saying that the church has to go through and be purified and all this other stuff. And, and uh, you know, that's I know... Work, that's work salvation, brother. Right, yeah. It's Ar Arminian work salvation. And so that completely shows that it's just completely Jesuitical. If they do not believe the church is the spotless and chaste virgin of Christ, which was 2 Corinthians 11 or Ephesians chapter 1. There's nothing we have to go through. We've been declared righteous. If they say anything mm -hmm. other than that, then they are work salvation heretics. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, if you think about it, if the rapture happens uh, and you're a Catholic and you're, let's, we'll just say that they teach it for a minute, it would totally destroy their own doctrine because you have purgatory. Well, if you go <laughs> right to be with the Lord, what do you do with purgatory? No. That's right. It's so, it's... You know, money-making doctrine of purgatory. Sure. All, the only reason the Pope came up with that is to mm -hmm. make money. Yeah. As Luther rightfully exposed. Right. But you know, I, I've just I've seen this thing where these guys will come out and they'll they'll sound legitimate for a while, and then you start to see these kind of Catholic undertones coming in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I, I know I've I've called a lot of these people. I've come out and, and openly said, you know, he acts like a Jesuit or he you know talks like a Jesuit, and I get you know people saying oh you're just conspiratorial and whatever else but it's right there <laughs> you know it's right there it's just uh, if it walks like a duck quacks like a duck it's got to be a duck you know? mm -hmm. and it's, it's their hard conclusions but like Joe Osteen he's a Jesuit coach out of Houston uh, don't think for one minute he can't pack that place out without the, the men of power in Houston oh, yeah. the Pope making that happen yeah so, you know all your major quote unquote TV evangelists are like that Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Rick Warren come out and Rick said Warren. he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Yep. So, yeah. Rick Joyner, all those guys. I haven't had to go so far as John McArthur. He's another one. The nice mm -hmm. blood redemption, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So, therefore, and what's he doing on uh, Larry King, huh? Yeah. That Jewish Freemason working for the Pope. What's he doing on that program? He wouldn't have you on, wouldn't have me on, would he? No. So, no, th all these big guys. Quote unquote big guys, but popularity or whatever, they're absolute Jesuit cultures because they will not deal with the topic of the Jesuits. That's another topic. Mm -hmm. That's a thing. That's a yeah. thing a Jesuit will not do. He will not go into detail about the the power of the Jesuit order, how it got there, its past. They'll never deal with the revocation of Edict of Nantes or Bartholomew's Massacre, the Thirty Years' War, or the Jesuits involved in Japan. They'll never go into those histories because. And that what, what what happens is the question is are they the same? Have they ever changed? And the mm -hmm. answer is absolutely not. Just like yep. Jesuit Lorenzo yeah. Ricci said, let them be as they are, or else not be. Nothing changes with them. The same game. Mm -hmm. Well, then I then I would definitely say that that would probably be one of the better ways, uh, another tip off, so to speak, um, when you're watching a ministry if they're not talking much about the Jesuits and really exposing them. I think that that's kind of a, and you start to see some of this other stuff, mm -hmm. I think that that's a, a good indication, you know, that there's some... I mean, look at Europe. The head of the central bank in Europe is Mario Draghi. Mario Draghi was Jesuit trained. He's a not a Malta. Now, why doesn't Bill O'Reilly 
or those other people, or Chris Matthews, or those other papal knights, tell you that on the news. Because they don't want you to know the Jesuits, after they decimated Europe and destroyed the Reformation out of Europe, in the Second Thirty Years' War from 1914 to 45, they don't want you to know that they completely reorganized it under a papal power in preparation for a dictator that they're bringing to power, justified by the Muslim invasion that they've caused in Europe. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what that's all about. Yeah. It's kind of funny, actually. I saw there was a lot of uh, videos on YouTube. I was, I was looking at some of them, and uh, I, I didn't, didn't even look at the channel name, and it was like all these videos really getting people riled up about, you know, the, the Syrian Arabs are raping German women and things. And, and you know, I'm sure that that's going on, but it was like really inciting, you know, hatred and violence. And I looked at the channel name. It was In Hoc Signo Vinces. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And I was like... This in the sign <laughs> conquer that's that was this yeah. was a byword of the knights templars yeah yeah oh so, yeah i just thought <laughs> so they're do i just like said in the past they, they're creating this this uh common enemy for all the white people of europe that are now absolutely apostate and infidels than to drive them into the arms of some dictator that mm -hmm. the pope of rome will control yeah. yeah yeah that's what i'm seeing it's bad situation but they're doing the same thing here. They're going to foment a black on white race war. That's why they have all the welfare. So we have huge black populations in the major cities and teach them to hate the white people. We'll put out all these movies like Django and all the others to teach them to hate white people. Then we'll have the black Muslims and other Masonic orders to incite them to race war uh, as they controlled all the major writings back in the 1960s. And then, the, then all of a sudden, departments of Homeland Security will come to the rescue and then they'll declare martial law and shut it down and bring out the guillotines and off to the camps. So that's why I tell my black friends, all the big black Masonic, all leaders are Masonic, and they're betraying me. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so that's, I believe that's what their game is right now in the major cities. And if um, they're using Trump, although everything that he says is generally true, generally true, it's playing upon the grievances of white people in general over the last 80 years. He is... He is like a Hitler. Hitler played on the same thing. There were mm -hmm. legitimate grievances of the Germans. Treaty of Versailles was wicked, um, but that's going to justify giving him lots of attention. But I'm tending to think that ultimately all the Republicans will break from him and support Hitler. That's what the game is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, we'll see. Because that's his purpose. Because yeah. Hillary was good to Bill. She didn't divorce him over all the things that he did when he was president. I'm convinced they promised her, listen, you stick with Bill, we'll make you president down the road. So I think this is payback time, and she knows it. They ran the most ridiculous uh, opponent against her, that Masonic Jew, socialist, communist, uh, out of Vermont. Uh, what's his name? Um, oh, uh, <laughs> it'll lose me right now, but uh, he's absolutely worthless, and uh, she'll have the Democratic nomination. Was it, Lieber so was it she, Lieberman? No, no, not Lieberman, it's a... Uh, Oh, what's his name, Eric? Uh, he's out of Vermont. Uh, his, his headquarters is in the Masonic Lodge in Burlingame. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, high-level Jewish Freemason. Yeah, he, de he defended Eugene Debs, was a notorious Jewish communist years ago. Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders. Mm. Okay. So they, they ran the worst possible candidate against Hillary to make sure she wins the Democratic Convention, and then she'll face off with Trump, and, and then probably th th there'll be a... Either Trump will either be going to his own party or stay with the Republicans. The Republicans will break and probably back Hillary. But, but I'm convinced that somehow, some way, they're going to put Hellcat Hillary in, not Donald Trump. Hmm. I just I know that a lot of times the way they work the thing is they they let the Democrats have it for a little bit, and then they bring in a quote unquote conservative Republican. You know, yeah. I was figuring they'd do that again, but you might be right. I don't know. It could be. I mean, either way they win, Trump's not going to change anything. They're, sure. still, they're still going to be under military government, military jurisdiction, and mm -hmm. they'll do what the Jesuits of Fordham tell them to do, because the Fordham Jesuits will tell Trump what to do in New York. Yeah. He, exactly. By the way, his, he, he lives on the 66th floor of his skyscraper hotel. 66? Hmm. And it's worth $100 million worth of furnishings. I mean, that's, almost, that's more than the cost of the building. And it was designed by an Italian-American Roman Catholic after the design of Louis XIV, the king of France. Louis XIV mm. was totally in the hands of the Jesuits. He, uh, he built Versailles, overseen by his knight of Malta, uh, Colbert. And then uh, Louis XIV 
uh, drove out all the French Huguenots, all the French Protestants, out of France in 1685 with the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. 500,000 died, 500,000 left, and populated yeah. Switzerland and Britain and came to this country and settled in the Carolinas. But all of this was done by the Jesuit Sun King, Louis XIV, of which Donald Trump absolutely loves. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, very interesting stuff. Um, hmm. I think I have a few other questions here. Uh, another another thing I had talked to you about a little bit before, the IHS symbol. Mm -hmm. um, is that another thing that, that Christians should be aware of when they see the IHS, uh, if they go to a church someplace or wherever, or if they see it, is that usually an indication of Jesuit influence Absolutely. there? Absolutely. Sure. Remember, IHS is the seal of the Jesuit Superior General. That was, that's the Loyola's seal that every general has maintained. And it's... Uh, it also ultimately goes back to the Templars and this side conqueror. And, but they say it means Jesus, the savior of mankind, in Latin. Uh, but the real meaning I maintain is it's Isis, Horus, Set. And so it's oh, Isis, set. the woman, Horus is the child that comes out of the woman, mm -hmm. and Set is the devil in Egyptian mythology. So Set will possess Horus. It's exactly what the Bible says, that the coming Antichrist will die, come back to life, be possessed by the devil, and I, he comes out of the Holy Mother Church. Mm -hmm. I maintain every pope's an antichrist. The papacy is the dynasty of the antichrist, and the final pope of Rome to be slain and rise from the dead will be the antichrist. Yeah, yeah, yeah I believe the, the reformers same were close, but not quite close enough. Yeah. Um, and another one there. I don't know if I can. I don't have the picture here with me, but it's a. Uh, I'd. It's a, let me show you here. It's kind of a little rough drawing of it here. Um, see if I can get this thing like that. Yep, mm -hmm. I see it. It's like a little butterflies or something in between this triangle with the circles on the mm -hmm. corners. Um, I saw a, a banner of that in a in a uh, Lutheran church, and I mean, did you ever see that symbol before? Never have. It's got the IHS in the center though. Yeah. You know, yeah, where, that's the telltale. But of course, the equilateral triangle has always been Rome symbol. I have a my uh, PowerPoint, my conspiracy conference PowerPoint. I have at least ten Roman Catholic cathedrals with with the with the equilateral triangle hmm. on their churches, on their temples, I should say. So that's always been their symbol. And the Jesuits took that symbol and put it in Freemasonry, and then it's on the dollar bill since 1935. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's that's their symbol. Hmm. Could there be different, um, I mean, within the Jesuit system, could there be different, uh, like, sub-orders within that? Or is it pretty much just Jesuits or Jesuits? No. The low-level Jesuits know nothing of what's going on. It's like the Masons. The low-level Jesuits are educators, administrators, many of them doing the right thing and what they feel is the right thing. You know, I, I know a couple of them. I know one passed away a few years ago. He talked about Jesuit spirituality, but when I talked to this Jesuit, his name was Brother Suds. He's since passed away. He's buried over at the spiritual center here about uh, 10 miles away. In, Warnersville. Uh, Clyde, yeah, not far from uh, yeah. And so, Warnersville. Yeah. And so, uh, Brother Suds, I told him, I said, listen, Walter Sizek was a Jesuit inquisitor. He went to the novitiate there, then he was he was uh, ordained and invited. And uh, the heads of New York City, including Genevieve Brady, Nicholas Brady, were his sponsors into the order. And he went into Europe in 1939, about the time Hitler invades uh, Poland, and he goes to the Russian side. He and a Russian Jesuit are together, and then when Stalin invades Poland 17 days later, Walter Sizek and the Russian Jesuit go to Moscow. And they're supposedly arrested as Jesuits, but secretly, uh, Walter Sizek is, is tutored in the art of torture for five years in Lubyanka. Lubyanka had a library in it of many books from the Spanish Inquisition, where they learned to torture the Russian Orthodox men, people. <laughs> and so after his five years of tuition, uh, of teaching there, then he went out to be a foremost Jesuit in the Gulag. And, I, and, they, and Kennedy brought him back on a spy exchange in 1963. And his brother, brother Suds was there, the Jesuit 
Sazina. And I said, tell me, Brother Suds, I said, when they brought Sizik back, I said, were his fingers gnarled? Did he look like he was underweight? And he said, no, he didn't. I said, he looked in fine health, didn't he? Because I've seen the pictures. He said, yes, he did. I said, Brother Suds, Walter Sizik was a Jesuit inquisitor. He killed millions of Russian people that were Orthodox heretics in the light of the Vatican. Hmm. And Sud sat there and he said, Oh, Walter. Oh, Walter. And I know he believed me. So that, then right then, I, there I knew that there were low-level Jesuits that mean well. Because Sud Zena took care of the grounds there out in the mission. But there are hmm. the high Jesuits, the men of power. In fact, um, in 2000, I drove out there to the novitiate that was taken out. I picked your wife at the time out there to show her. A nice place to take your wife. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and lo and behold, there was about 50 Jesuits and all black Cossacks. And there he was, Peter Hans Kolbenbach. I said, wow. I probably ought to get out of here because I don't think I should stay around. <laughs> no. But there he was, and he was anointing the grave of Walter Sizek. Oh, boy. The only Jesuit to get that kind of attention meaning that he had to be a high-level killer inquisitor to get that kind of praise. So the low-level Jesuits don't know much, but the high Jesuits absolutely do know. All the ten provincials in America know. The Jesuit presidents of all the Jesuit universities know. That's 28 of them. And so between, there's probably 50 to 100 Jesuits that are really the men of power in North America. The low-level ones really don't know much. Hmm. Another question. Um... Aksarben. Have you heard of that? What is it? Aksarben. It's uh, Nebraska spelled backwards, but it's an organization out there, in uh, mostly in Omaha, Nebraska, if you know about Omaha, the Boys Town Boys thing Town. out there. Yeah. Cardinal um, Spellman oversaw that. Yeah. yeah, but there's a, it's a, I, I think it's yearly that they have this Aksarben ball. It's the kind of the rich elite of Omaha. Well, the mm -hmm. Omaha and the surrounding areas, over in Iowa and everything. My wife's from that area. And they have this elaborate ball, and they, they have an older businessman, and he'll be crowned as the king. And then they have a young, you know, probably in her teens, uh, late teens girl, and she's crowned as the queen. And they actually have a Catholic bishop that presides over the thing. I don't know if you ever heard of that. I've never heard of it, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. yeah. Because of... Cause of Catholic Archbishop of San Francisco oversees Bohemian Grove. <laughs> hmm. Bohemian Grove is 86 miles north of the University of San Francisco, where the Jesuits have their university there. That, uh, hmm. Anton LaVey used to speak there regularly. That yeah. good Catholic boy. Hmm. And um, But, uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all. They have their orgies. They have their all that stuff going on. I, it, Tom Cruise put a movie out years ago called Eyes Wide Shut with... Uh, the producer of it, uh, what was his name? He was an Adamolta. It was one big orgy in the house of the Rothschild mansion in uh, Great Britain. They rented that mansion for the movie. And so um, it happens all the time, and it keeps these men in sexual sin and impurity so that they will always be submitted to the order. They will not be able to get out. Well, how did, what about uh, Greek fraternities and sororities? That's the beginning. The fraternities and sororities are the beginning. I think, in fact, um, um, oh, Code Word Barbalon, the first volume deals with sororities and fraternities, even though I don't agree with his Adventist thing, and he's saying that America was created by Jesuits, and George Washington was a Jesuit. That, that's all nonsense, but he does deal very well with the Jesuit oversight of the fraternities and sororities. Hmm. Yeah. So, in other words, somebody could go to a non-Jesuit university, go through the Greek sorority fraternity thing, and then later go on into I don't know how you'd even say that but they could you know eventually get it tied up with the, the Jesuit order it'll go to some secret society the subject to the Jesuits like Yale hmm. I mean you okay. have the skull and bones you have what the with the snake and what's the other one called the snake and something and uh, but yeah. all these little secret societies and universities and these are in the dossiers of the men who graduate and then they're chosen in the major corporations to go to work there or in politics or whatever because the Council on Foreign Relations is full of these secret societies. So the CFR runs the federal government, but they're appointed there by men in secret societies who know they're trustworthy. Hmm. So it's the, the extent of the massiveness of this conspiracy is 
huge. Yeah. But all we want to go is right to the center and the heart of it, the Jesuit order and the secret societies that it controls. Mm hmm Yeah. Um, found a thing interesting. I was like, doing a little bit of research into this. I don't know. I haven't read your whole book yet. I I can only read, you know, it's online and or like it's on the computer, and uh, I can't read a whole lot on the computer. Only stand so much of that. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's I I've printed out parts of it and things, you know, and, and read it that way. Eventually, I'm probably just going to print it out and I can read it that way. I'm not used to uh, online reading, but uh, or computer reading, I should say. Mm. But uh, I don't know if you have covered this at all, but um, I found a, the assassination of uh, Empress Elizabeth in Austria right, right around the late 1800s. Oh, yeah, she has Sissy. She was called Sissy. Yeah. Um, I, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I thought, I thought she, that was... She was... Yeah, I have it in my book. Oh, really? That they she was a beautiful woman, too. She was the uh, greatest equestrian in Europe. And uh, mm -hmm. she was the dear friend of Ludwig II. Crazy Ludwig out of Bavaria, who designs Ludendorff, Ludendorff, Ludendorff and the Schwanstein Castle. Beautiful castles. Okay. Just, it's, it's the castle the Walt Disney patterned his castle mm. after in Disneyland. Maybe. Okay. So, yes, they killed Ludwig II. We shot him in the back twice. And I have that document in my book from a Bavarian contact that I have. He did not drown. They shot him in the back twice. And then, because Sissy, she was trying to protect him. Because Sissy, Sissy would not go along with um, a lot of the anti-Jewish fury that was going on in the 1800s at the time. Because then hmm. they were building their Jewish question fury from the 1880s on. And she wasn't going along with it. So they killed Ludwig II, and then they killed Sissy. Yeah. They knifed, she was knifed through the heart with a, with a triple-sided file that had been sharpened by the assassin. And as he walked by her, he shoved it and pricked her heart. She was walking with a Rothschild lady. And notice they didn't kill the Rothschild. Hmm. They killed her. And uh, she went back to her mansion then and ultimately passed away. That's how they killed Sissy. It's yeah. all in my book. I have the pictures there, too. Yeah, I'll definitely have to read that part. I, it just seemed kind of suspicious from what I was reading because I thought, you know, this guy just kind of walks up and stabs her and... He's just kind of a, it's that lone gun thing again, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's typical like, Jesuit assassination. I mm -hmm. thought it was interesting, too, that uh, one of the pages in her court ended up later becoming the Jesuit, uh, was it Wuchinsky or something, I think? Oh, the, oh. Head of, the, uh, head of the Jesuit order there, was I think it was Wuchinsky. Was it? Lerichowski. Well, Lerichowski had a cardinal uncle. Yes. So, yeah, probably Lerichowski. Lerichowski was a general from 1915 to 1942. Okay. So, uh, was, was there a Wojcinski, though? Jesuit Wojcinski. general? Um, not that I can remember. Okay. There was a Wurtz, Francis Xavier Wurtz. There was um, a few others, but not Wojcinski. You might want to hmm. see here. Maybe I read that wrong. Uh, let me see. Um, let me see. Richie... Nope. Nope. At the time of Sissy, it would have been uh, Peter Jean Bex, 1853 to 1887. And, uh, but Peter Jean Bex was the tutor of Karl Marx in the British Museum teaching him communism. Bex was the hmm. tutor of Karl Marx for communism. So just the Jesuits created communism. <laughs> Sorry. Hmm. Marx is a 33rd hmm. degree for Jewish Freemason. Any Jewish Freemason is always somehow, some way connected to the Pope. Like Morris Deese of the Southern Poverty Law Center, of which I'm going mm -hmm. to be interviewed by the Lebanon Daily News in about 15 minutes about him. He <laughs> has attacked me. So I said, okay, we'll deal with Morris Deese. Yeah. Well, we'll be <laughs> praying for you. Thank you. But, uh, uh, well, I definitely don't want to hold you up for your upcoming interview. Um, Sounds like a interesting one coming up for you. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think if I have any other questions for you right now. Uh, just, hmm. Just remember they control the political parties. They control the intelligence communities. They control the military. Anybody in the military that disobeys, they, get, they relieve him like crystal. Uh, anybody who does what they're supposed to do, they stay in power. So. I mean, that's, that's the power that they wield today here. And, 
And this is the heart and soul of the Jesuit orders, military and commercial complex to reduce all nations to the temple power of the Pope. And when they're finished using us, then they will conquer this place and put us under military government, open the camps and do what they intend to do pursuant to the Council of Trent. Hmm. May the Lord help us to stop it. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's why I wanted to do this. Um, one other question, uh, a PhD educated Jesuit, they go through the Jesuit school or whatever and they come out with a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, would they, could they continue, I mean, are they, how do I want to say it, would they be considered a lower level or if you get to the PhD level in a Jesuit school, are you going to come out a little bit higher level? Or? Yeah, they'll be higher because they're going to know how they can use their PhD. Like Norman Geisler, he was trained by Jesuits at Loyola in Chicago. Oh, really? He's a PhD. Norman hmm. Geisler went to teach at Dallas Theological Seminary. So, yeah, and he they know what they're about. Yeah. He endorses uh, James White's book, Against the King James. Is that right? Yep. Geisler does that. I think he that? actually, I think it's right on the front cover, actually. It's, I think his endorsement. Mm -hmm. So, so that shows you Geisler's working for the Jesuits. Hmm. Shows you Dallas is totally destroyed and infiltrated. Done. Yeah. When it used to be pretty good with Chafer and a couple of those other guys, but it's totally gone. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll bring this to an end. Uh, thank okay. you. Very, thank you very much for your time, brother. I really enjoyed it. My pleasure to be on with you, Brian. Lord bless you, and Lord bless your listeners and viewers. <laughs> All right. Well, we will uh, check in with you some other time in the future, and uh, if I can come up with some more questions for you. So. Sure, brother. Anytime. Okay. Well, right. may the Lord bless you, and, and uh, we'll be praying for your interview. Thank you. Lord bless you too, Brian. All right. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah.